Hey, how's it going everybody? Bradley Guitar just here. I uh, had a customer bring me these two amplifiers uh, from the 1960s. Uh, over here on the left hand side we have a Gibson Skylark. This is a GA5 and then we have its big brother the GA5T Skylark over here on the right hand side. The T stands for tremolo uh, and this one has it. Uh, we're gonna probably do some modifications on these uh, in addition to just an overall general service. Uh, so if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, please stick around. There are a couple differences in these. Um, one of them is older than the other. Uh, this one over here on the left hand side I believe is the older of the two. This one is uh, a little bit closer to the start of the run of uh, what's called the Crestline series. And you can always identify a Crestline series Gibson amplifier by the little crest right there. You see it right by the power switch. And basically what it amounts to is a little crest with a, I think it's got a goose on it. It's got a knight and a goose. I'm not sure what that crest stands for. If anyone knows, let me know because I would be interested to know myself uh, whose family crest that is or whatever. Maybe that's the Gibson family crest. I have no idea. But anyway, that's the... Uh, crest in crest line and this one is in phenomenal condition the only real flaw I guess is the broken logo right there but uh, other than that this is probably just about the cleanest crest line amplifier I have seen this one has a little bit of a, of a duller uh, chassis and I'm not sure if that's aluminum or not I uh, can't remember if that year was aluminum and that one is definitely steel this one over on this side. Uh, I do know that this uh, amplifier, the GA5, uh, is lighter than this one, so that might account for the difference in weight. Uh, at any rate, this is the older of the two. They had a few different cosmetic uh, changes during the Crestline era, and this is a br kind of a brownish uh, covering on this one. And this one's got the, uh, the later style um, I call this like the faux uh, tree bark um, covering on this one. And actually you can also see uh, uh, sequentially which one com came first by the serial number. This is a 401 and this one is a 755 which puts it much much later in the in the Crestline era. Uh, and this one kind of has a, more of a salt and pepper kind of a grill and you can see it's got a little bit of a staining on there and it's also missing its logo. Other than that the chassis is in real good shape. A lot of these Crestline era amps because of the uh, because of the upward direction of the faceplate and the way that they face they have a, uh, a tendency to rust quite a lot and plus they're steel. Uh, this one has these style of knobs and basically what this knob is if I were to pop this knob off let's see if I can do it yeah there we go look you see the numbers there basically what they've done is they've repurposed the guitar amp or excuse me the uh, guitar knob you see the one to the zero to ten there and what they've done is they've painted the underneath um, rather than rather than filling in those little grooves with uh, paint so that they appear on the outside. They've actually just painted the whole thing black so you don't see it and they've changed the dome. So basically this is a chrome dome guitar knob uh, but with a different dome and, and uh, some different paint. Um, these knobs, if you ever lose one of these because nobody reproduces them, uh, you can actually just order a new chrome dome knob and uh, scratch out the paint that's in them and paint it all black and you can kind of replicate this look um, and you'll also have to paint on the red arrow as well but but yeah we're gonna start with this one over here and open it up and um, give it a service and again we might do some modifications on it here's the rear of the two amps and you can see later in the era they kind of lengthen this back door a little bit this one over here has a tube chart on the bottom, but uh, it does not have the original speaker. I can tell that just by looking at the speaker. It's not original. Somebody's replaced that at some point. Could be a, an eminence, perhaps. There we see we have a 6x4 rectifier, 6AQ5, two of those actually for push-pull output. 6C4 and a 6EU7. 
This one does, as you as you can tell, have the original speaker, and we'll get a closer look at that. Although it's not going to give us a date because the date code is underneath this sticker, I think. So anyway, we will open uh, that one up first, and then we'll come back and look at this one. Okay, here we are with this thing out on the bench, and uh, do you reckon we need a new power cord? Look at that. But that's how some of them get, man. When they're when they're this old, they just, especially if they've been exposed to certain climactic, climatic, not climactic, but climatic conditions. Uh, you know, they'll kind of do that. They'll crack on you and definitely need a replacement. This is an unusual, kind of an unusual thing, but they've stabilized the chassis in these. Let's see if I can get a good shot of them. They stabilize the rear of the chassis by kind of bolting it to the back door. So we have to get these unbolted. I wonder how many of these amps are missing these bolts <laughs> from repairmen who just decided not to bother putting them in. Probably a lot. But there they are. Okay, and this is indeed a plywood back, and it looks like... Is that asbestos? I think that's asbestos. You can't slide it out the front, obviously, because of the tubes and the transformers they're gonna hit so I think I have to take the baffle out to get this thing out of here I definitely do because see the blocks there's a little channel that the chassis slides in and there's a block up here on top of it so you can't raise it up and just slide it out the blocks are preventing you from doing that so this thing's mounted in here in a very weird way so I have to take out the uh, baffle board um, to get this chassis out Now I can get the chassis out. So that's a really, that's a really big pain in the ass to have to do that um, when you work on an amp to take the whole thing apart like that. It's not surprising then that they changed the design for. Ah! Jesus Christ! Okay, finally got this chassis out of this thing. And interestingly, this entire upper section of this amplifier appears to be covered, every little surface appears to be covered in what's got to be asbestos. I don't think it's any more of a risk than the things that you come into contact with on a day-to-day -day basis. So This chass chassis is definitely aluminum. I don't know if you can see it or not. The caps have been replaced, the power caps. Uh, these sprags are original. These cap capacitors have also been replaced. Uh, the death capacitor was left in. Of course, the two-prong cord was never changed. I don't know why they would change caps, but not not uh, go ahead and change the cord, especially if it's in that kind of shape. Because those those caps right there aren't all that old. So whoever was in here wasn't in here all that long ago. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is just cut this power cord and I'm gonna cut it off right, right there. It'll make it a little easier to get this, to get it off of there. Okay, it says that on this one, the pilot light's not working, so I'll change the pilot light, change the cord to a three-prong cord. Uh, it's already been recapped uh, for the most part and these caps fare a little bit better. These are the Black Beauties. They they, in my experience, uh, they can be leaky, but they do fare a little bit better, well, way better actually than the bumblebees. So they, they might be okay, but we'll test them to make sure the caps are okay. Um, and also, I, I mentioned to him that um, uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, slight modifications on one or two of these capacitors can really beef these up, and he seemed, he seemed okay with that. Uh, so we may explore that as well and see how that goes. 
he did he did want a little bit more bass out of the thing um and he also said on the okay well the GA5 has I think one or two more issues so we'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it but for now let's go ahead and put the K, uh, cord on this and this should this one shouldn't be a, a big deal Now here's something interesting. This light, this thing's barely hanging on. Wow. Oh, the whole bulb's busted. See there? So not only was it out, but it was it was completely ob obliterated. I don't see any glass in here, though. Huh? Maybe the glass uh, maybe the glass slowly fell out over time. Or let's see. Uh, let me get in here with something. gonna say maybe the glass either slowly fell out or um, the last person who worked on this cleaned it out and didn't change the bulb that's possible I guess okay so we'll change this bulb these are always one of the hardest parts to change in an amp these bayonet style light holders these things are a pain in the dick. All right. Somebody, the problem is somebody had over tightened this, I think, and they put the wrong size bulb in probably and shattered the bulb. I, I don't know, that's what I'm guessing. But anyway. Okay, we've got the power cord on this thing and we're about to dial it up for the first time on the Variac with the power cord. And looks like the new light is working so far. And I've got sound and filaments. So we're good on all that.
Okay, well, um, it does sound good. It's got a nice crunch when you crank it. Uh, it does seem to lack something in the bottom end, though. I, uh, once again, the bypass capacitors uh, for a couple of these stages appear to have been changed. Um, and I, I don't, well, they're definitely changed, but I don't know whether they upgrade or change the value. Let's look at the schematic and see what they did with the values on those when they changed them. Okay, this one's pretty much ready to go. Um, I do have a loose input jack. I'm going to tighten that up a little bit. Uh, and the only real mod I think I'm going to make on this is I'm going to bump up the bypass capacitor on this output a little bit. I might also bump this one up a little bit. Um, the right now they're at 22 microfarad. I might bump them each up to like a 33 or maybe one to a 50 and the other to a 33 because uh, these have already been changed and um, there's other ways to get more bass through the amp and uh, express more bass at the output. Um, but these capacitors have already been changed and this is a pretty you know that's a pretty nice example it's, and it's fairly still original with the exception of the necessary things uh, so I think I'm just gonna I'm, I'm just gonna modify it uh, by changing these values and then we'll see where that gets us and I think that's gonna be okay the only problem with it is it's so hard to get this thing in and out of the cabinet and to really uh, demonstrate it and to check it out how you know to know how it's gonna sound um, you really have to put the speaker inside the cabinet to really, you know, to really understand what the cabinet is going to do. Because cabinet is a lot of the equation as far as bass and stuff is concerned, especially. So, if you're talking about, you know, trying to modify it to express more bass, it's kind of hard to do that without getting in the cabinet. And this thing is so hard to get in and out. I don't want to do that too many times, but we'll check it out and see. And if uh, I need to pull it back out again, that's just what we'll do. But uh, I'm going to start with upping these values. One or two other things I might try. There is a capacitor right here that's a 500 picofarad and it goes from I believe the second stage on to the third stage. Um, and I might make that a, a .001. Also these inputs are uh, 100k on the resistors. Um, and there's really no difference between the two inputs. If you plug into one or the other, uh, one of them is going to have slightly greater ground reference because you're going through a um, you're going through 100k and then a one meg, so you're going through 1.1 meg total. And if you plug into this one, you're going through you have a one meg ground reference. So there's slight different on the ground reference, but there's no difference on the input. Uh, resistor. So what I might do is change one of these input resistors, this one. So this will be kind of a, uh, the second input will be a little bit, um, uh, a little bit more like a high uh, impedance input. So we'll try that and uh, maybe think about also changing this. Okay, so I did change this uh, second resistor to a 47K. I went ahead and left this 500 pico. I tried it with a 001, and it just seems it seemed to have um, a little bit too much low uh, mid range, um, and it just didn't really. I don't know. It sounded better with the 500 pico, so I left that in there. And uh, this actually was an improvement because it seems to seems to bring out more highs, and you can kind of roll off your tone knob on your guitar and uh, compensate if you want. So. Um, yeah, let's. Uh, I think we're done with this one. Let's button this one up and let's move on to the, to the next one. All right, the first amplifier is done, and here's the second one. And this one is actually constructed in the same way. Um, and I guess it's been a little while since I've seen one of these because I'd forgotten that this model did this. And I guess they all must have because this one does it too. And this is one of the later versions. Uh, the back door on this one is a chipboard, so that differentiates it from the other one, which was uh, plywood. Um, and the bolts, or excuse me, the nuts for this were not present. So, um, and I don't, I don't think they're in the back of the amplifier either. So we're missing a couple of these little nuts. I'll have to dig up some nuts to um, to put on here at the end of this because otherwise this thing will just slide in and out. Um, so that's not very secure. Uh, also, this one still has the old electrolytic capacitors, 
And actually, I don't even know if these are original, but this is, well, they're probably not. But that's not a safe situation, so we'll fix this. Uh, change this one. And he said the tremolo was not working, and plus, later on in the run of these, they went to those dreaded things right there. That's, uh, that's what I call the Sprague Tone Sucking Network. Um, they've gone to orange drop caps, which I would have assumed should have been pretty good caps, but um, if the tremolo's not working, then that usually points to caps. It could also be a tube, so um, the addition of that 6EU7 on that second stage, the second uh, second triode is used for the oscillator. So we'll check all this out, uh, pull this out, and uh, get a look at it. Okay, here's the GA5T out on the bench, and um, we can see that it's, it's had a definitely had a change of capacitors at some point in its life, and they really didn't do all that great of a job. These are just kind of floating around. At least one of them, I guess, is through the old capacitor ring retainer, um, but then they just kind of slapped a bunch of tape on this and said, "Good enough." Um, but we're gonna do something about that because obviously that's not good enough. And these capacitors are probably fairly old in their own right. So we'll change these, I'm sure, while we're in here. Also, this one over here is ancient. This is the original. And it's 1965, 15th week. Uh, this one, these are, might be 1981. That's what they look like they might be to me. At least I think that that's what that code is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so these need to go. This needs to go. Um, and we also need to go through and check some of these other capacitors. Now these orange capacitors that were used in Gibson's tend to hold up okay. These, these um, are pretty good in my experience. Now that, that doesn't always hold true, but on the whole they're pretty decent. Um, that may not be the case in this one, so we'll go through and check some of them. And he did say that the tremolo was not working, so that'd be the first thing we check. These should be the tremolo caps right here, these three. Uh, this one probably also has to do with the tremolo as well. We'll also check the t one of the tubes, uh, this one, uh, to make sure it's, it's good, because uh, with the tremolo not working, as he said, uh, this is always a suspect. It also could be that it's an intermittent uh, connection or contact on the uh, socket or something like that that is causing the issue as well, so we'll check that out. We're going to change the two-prong cord on this thing to a three-prong, but just for the time being, we're going to use, uh, for test purposes, we're going to go ahead and just use the two-prong and uh, fire it up on the Variac and see kind of where that gets us. We'll take some uh, voltage measurements as we dial it up, um, especially on these nodes. And we'll take some voltage measurements kind of throughout to make sure we're not uh, leaking any DC anywhere. Sometimes it takes a minute for the rectifier to start conducting before you're going to get voltage. And there we go. You notice it took a second for that to happen. Now it's starting to take off. And we'll go ahead and dial it up to where I can read it over here on my meter. And it's uh, 66 volts on the input, 0.12 amps. We're up to 69, 70 volts here and climbing. Okay, I've got sound. And just as he stated, no tremolo yet. And if it is indeed a 6EU7, 6EU7s, they do have a, there we go, just like I said, pins weren't getting good contact on the 6EU7, now it works. And you can just, well, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it, but I can actually hear it through the hum. So I know the tremolo works. Um, let's take some voltage measurements throughout the circuit then. Let's maybe look at... Uh, Look here, for instance, there should be zero volts DC, and there are. 
Okay, it's, not, it's back to not working again. It seemed like when I tried to read that voltage, that it stopped working at that point. So let's go ahead and dial it on all, all the way up to full working voltage. Yeah, I turned it off and back on, now it works. It's actually strong. Now what I think when I read this it's gonna No it is working. And you can actually see it jumping around here. And if you're in a situation where you can't uh, where you can't hear the output on something like this, or you have a dummy load in or whatever, and you don't feel like hooking it up to a scope, uh, you can always just meter it and see if it's jumping around. And it is. You can hear it even going with the sound there. The oscillations will get faster. Okay, so tremolo is good. Let's do uh, let's do some more checks, voltages here and there. Well, that's an odd reading. What's going on with that one? Still in the tremolo circuit right there. Be the cathode. 249 volts on this side and 249 volts on the other side of that. Okay, that's um again this one this one has a little capacitor in between. It looks like it has a capacitor in between the uh, primary of the output across the primary. So it's another another odd little thing. It's kind of taken from hi-fi. Um, and this is the cathode. Interesting is this doesn't seem to have a cathode bypass. No, yes, it does. Cathode bypass is over here, separated from the uh, bias resistor. And the cathode bypass value is 20 microfarad, which I think is the same as on the uh, the GA5. But now that we're up to full voltage, we can kind of get some readings here. 253 on the primary node, 247 on the next node down, and if we trace it through, we should get 247 there, and then it drops down again, 166, drops down over to here as well. 12 uh, so we're getting good voltages throughout that's good 211 right there 212 same difference and that should drop down to 56 it should be about 156 in both places because those are the same resistors 143. So one of these resistors is either drifted um, or the tube is conducting more on that other side. Eh. Yeah, that's just going to be nothing. I mean, everything is definitely working on the SAMP. Um, the thing is, this one again has that little. Uh, has that little Sprague, what I call tone sucking network right there, that thing, that couplet or couplet. Uh, and that, as far as I'm concerned, um, is responsible for really kind of dumbing down the tone on these, really kind of cleaning it up, making it um, very tinny, very ice picky, and really only suitable uh, for Gibson guitars because at the time they were trying to keep their amplifiers as clean as possible with their Gibson guitars and 
Uh, really the only way to do that is to uh, shape the frequency so severely that um, the humbuckers would not slam the front end and just distort it. Um, you know, most of the 50s amplifiers that you get, Dan Electros, Fenders, uh, old Valcos, things like that, and even Gibsons from that era, uh, if you slam the front end of one of those things, I mean, you know, stand back and look out, and you're going to, you know, because you're going to get, uh, you're going to get some overdrive out of the thing. Uh, if you really hit it hard with a humbucker. That is not what the players of the day tended to go for, um, especially the players who selected Gibsons, it seems. Uh, most of the blues people, uh, like Chicago Blues, which was kind of starting to get distorted, they were using mainly uh, cheap Chicago-made amplifiers like, uh, well, I say cheap, they were really well-made. Um, Valcos uh, and Dan, Elect Dan, well, Dan Electros also because uh, you could get those in catalogs, but um, you know, mainly the Chicago made stuff because that's where they were from, and um, you know, that's what they had probably most access to. So, you know, Gibson really tried to disassociate itself early on with um, uh, with overdrive, and you know, and they really were slow to catch on to the whole rock and roll craze. You can look at some of their advertisements from the 1960s and even as late as like 1966-67 even with the the Beatles having been around for a couple years and all the long hair coming in and um, you know Summer of Love and Flower Power and psychedelic music and all this stuff coming in they still were trying to push like uh, a very uh, clean tone so I don't know it seems to me a mistake. Some other people, I'm sure, will disagree, but um, it's a. I think it's a total mistake. I think it's one of the reasons for the downfall of Gibson's amplifier line is because they did not build their amplifiers to be suitable to a wide range of electric instruments uh, other than their own. So what we're going to do on this one, I've, I've basically been given, uh, well, not carte blanche, but I've been given the okay to, to try to improve the tone. And one of the things I'm going to do is remove this couplet right here um, and we will essentially just bypass this couplet and uh, rewire this stage so that that's not in circuit and what that's going to do is that's going to express a lot more of the low end a lot more of the mid-range uh, that's getting scooped out also the thing's going to be a lot less tinny um, a lot less uh, like it's trying to emulate a fender tone a blackface-ish fender tone uh, when you have a Gibson guitar plugged in. Um, and the, and with the problem with that is you plug a Fender guitar into one of these um, or something, you know, any of these Gibsons from this kind of era and they just sound so tinny it's almost hard to uh, listen to. So I think that was their goal <laughs> to make it hard, to, hard for uh, Fender owners to listen to one of their amps when when you play a Fender guitar through it so we're gonna remove that and fix that situation actually before I go in and start modifying the circuit I'm gonna uh, go ahead and do the electrolytics and we'll start with this one This example of the amp uh, that I have in front of me has a few more components than what is on the schematic. If we look right here, we have the first stage. Uh, out of the first stage, we have a uh, .0047 capacitor into one of the legs of this Sprague couplet. And then the middle leg, the number two leg, goes over here to uh, ground. And the number three leg goes... Uh, to the input of the uh, pot and then out of the pot it goes on to the next stage through a uh, looks like a hundred K uh, we have on the schematic that I'm showing here we have uh, something quite different 
Uh, we don't show the couplet at all. We actually have coming out of here uh, going through a 0 .022 capacitor uh, into the loudness control and then on to the next stage with no grid stopper. Uh, so this component is not in there either. We'll probably end up leaving this one, uh, but we're definitely, I'm certain we're going to have to change this capacitor once we get this out of circuit because uh, the frequencies will be all, all off. So we'll probably remove this from circuit and then look at changing this capacitor as well. Okay, here we are with this thing fired up first before we do any kind of changes. The only thing I've changed are the capacitors. See how tinny that is. I mean, I'll, I'll turn it up just a little bit more so you can kind of get a better idea. Really tinny, even uh, even when I'm on the neck position. That was the neck position. So, yeah, definitely not the tone shaping you really need for a Fender guitar. And unfortunately, uh, you know, it doesn't sound a whole lot better really with a Gibson. It doesn't sound like you would expect an amp like this to sound with a Gibson guitar uh, pushing through through it. So, um, yeah, so we're going to do some mods. Alright, so to aid in selecting a capacitor to couple this first stage and the second stage, uh, I have instituted the capacitor substitution box in that position and uh, that way you can kind of flip through different values of capacitors and select the one that uh, you think sounds the best. And the one I've settled upon is a 0.1 capacitor, which seems kind of large. I'm not used to using 0.1 capacitors, but in this case, that is the one that I deemed um, sounded the best in that position. So that's what I'm going to put in there. Uh, it gives it some, uh, some good chunky lows with the Telecaster, and uh, it's not too thick uh, for uh, the humbucker guitar that I've been using. So we'll stick that in there and I think we're going to be about done with this thing. I might go ahead might go ahead and change these uh, bypass capacitors and then again I might not. They seem to be okay but uh, they are old so and, and they are electrolytic so I might as well go ahead and change them. But they're in low voltage positions so but yeah I think I'll go ahead and change those anyway. I'll just be on the safe side and then we'll button this thing up and be done with it. Well, it's a good thing I did decide to pull these capacitors. This one here is cracked on the side. Also, it's measuring way off from what it's supposed to be. Uh, and by the way, I just bought one of these testers. Um, I got this off of uh, banggood.com. Uh, it'll test just about anything. Uh, it'll tell you if uh, capacitors are lossy. For the most part, it will. It didn't do it on that one. But it'll tell you if they're lossy, it'll uh, test ESR, things like that. But this one's so far off, um, it's ob obviously bad. This one was way off as well, and it's obviously bad. Uh, these Sprague's actually tested good. They have low ESR and are in good shape. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll recycle these into something. But yeah, I'll put a link where you can get one of these down in the description. Um, you should really pick yourself up one of these. These are cheap. Um, they come with a nice little nice little plastic box. I'll uh, link you to the one where you can get the plastic box. You can buy the, just the unit on, on its own if you want, if you want to build your own box. But this one comes with the standoffs and the hardware and everything. So um, yeah, yeah, definitely worth having, man, if you're, uh, if you're doing this kind of stuff. Um, and plus if you want a cheap ESR meter, ESR meters are, are expensive and this thing is really cheap and it does not just capacitors, this thing does uh, everything. It'll do, uh, it'll do diodes, it'll do resistors, it'll do um, just about anything you put in here. Transistors, it'll tell you if it's NPN or PNP. So yeah, really useful little unit and they're real cheap. I think I gave 12 bucks, 13 bucks or something for this one with the case. So 
Worth having for sure. Pick yourself up one of those. Just for comparison's sake, uh, here's what a good capacitor should measure like. You see 27.49 microfarad, uh, low ESR, 0.69, and only 1% loss. So, cool, cool piece of gear. Glad I bought that. All right, here we are all complete. Uh, all the changes have been made, and we are ready to give this thing a listen. Okay, I went to do the test on this thing and uh, had an interesting issue. Uh, I'll try to recreate it here, if we can. If I turn this all the way up, you'll hear it's uh, There comes a point where it goes into kind of a high frequency oscillation. I can actually get that to stop by moving a couple components around and actually what it appears that I'm actually doing is is changing the position of this pin right here which is uh, uh, that is a, one of the plates and it appears it's maybe kind of getting better connection you can also change the position of this first tube and grab it and make that stop as well. So I think I've got a bad V1 tube. And I'll demonstrate here. Okay, you hear that high pitched squeal? That's what it's, uh, that's what it's doing when it's more or less all the way up about between maybe 9 and 10 on the volume dial but I can make that stop by simply grabbing the tube so um, I think we have a bad preamp tube and since these are both six EU7s um, and also since the second one the V2 tube is less critical uh, and it also has uh, tremolo that it's handling there. Um, you can have a microphonic tube that's handling tremolo, so that, that side of the tube shouldn't matter. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure if that's the same side or not, but even if it's the third stage uh, in the amplification uh, process, if it's the phase inverter, that should still be better than it being the V1 tube. So I'm going to swap these tubes around and see if it, that makes it disappear. Okay, let's try this again, see if it happens again. Also, be just a bad connection on that pin. It could also be that I'm simply trying to push too much gain uh, into that second stage. That's a that's definitely a possibility. Um, I did change. It seemed to begin after I changed this capacitor. So, uh, I mean, this is a 25 microfarad rather than a 20. Um, 
So, I mean, those additional, and that old one was probably not any good anyway, really. Uh, it actually wasn't measuring correctly, uh, so it was way off. So, I suppose I could try disconnecting this and see what, just see what it does. Um, also, this value of 0.1 is rather big uh, coming out of this first stage, so I may consider going down from there, but uh, let me see about um, changing this value first. All right, I have that bypass capacitor just removed entirely for the moment. And it's completely disappeared, uh, but we've lost a lot of our bottom end as well. So rather than a 25, what we might do is come back with maybe a 10 um, and see what that does. All right, we've tacked in a 10 microfarad right there just temporarily, and uh, we'll see what that does. Well, it's back to doing it again. So, um, I think we're going to have to take the approach of coming in and changing that... Uh, uh, that point one uh, coupling capacitor. Okay, I've tacked an uh, 047 capacitor in here and we'll see what that does. Actually, I know what it's going to do because I didn't put the 25 microfarad back. Well, same thing. Still doing it. Okay, um, the noise continues even after putting that uh, 047 capacitor in. Um, so what I've done here is this is a, I'm just making sure that the ground on the pot is good and that's not it. It could be a bad pot I suppose, but I don't think that's the case. Okay, so past the pot is where I'm taking, oops, past the pot is where I'm taking my measurement. And so that's when the that's when it kicks in right there and actually it's also present back here right here on the plate of the previous stage if I go back to the plate You can see it there as well so it is happening in it's actually happening in that stage so yeah a change in that is not going to help all right well i've temporarily removed the bias resistor there on this first stage and uh, i've kept my 25 microfarad bypass capacitor hooked up i have my decade box out and we're going to try some different uh we're going to try some different bias resistors on this first stage. I have the I have the volume totally cranked. Um, right now I have it on a thousand ohms. And if we take our probe, and if we probe just somewhere here past this first stage, this is actually right past the first stage, uh, we can see our there's a waveform for our noise, our oscillation. Okay. Now let's try, I'll take the probe off. Um, again, I'm at a thousand. Let's go down to 850. And it actually grew bigger. So let's go the other way. Let's go to 1.5 again. It's gone at 1.5. At least for the time being it is. But the thing is, I had 1.5 on there already. So I'm thinking if we go to like a 2.2K or a 2K, somewhere around in there, we should be fine permanently. 
and there's definitely nothing on there at, at 2K. And I can kind of wiggle things around and it will not go into that oscillation uh, at, well, at 2.2, but I think we can get away with 2K. I have some 2K resistors. So I'm gonna pop a 2K resistor into that position and we'll see what that does. Okay, that stage is rebiased, and I believe this thing is uh, completed. Uh, one note on these amplifiers, if you have one of these, uh, always try to use the second input. The reason you want to use the second input is, is because if you look here, that second input is not uh, is not a grounded input. So when you when you take your plug out of there, it doesn't ground itself like this one does. Uh, so you're going to get less noise at the input if you use the second input rather than the first. Let's uh, give this thing a listen, and we'll try to compare them side by. We'll compare this one side by side with the GA5.
Yeah, that's the uh, that's the GA5. Uh, hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Um, I know it's been a long one. Please stick around, hit the subscribe button to see more videos like this in the future. I've got a bunch of stuff coming up. Like I said, I've been backed up for a little while with some sickness, uh, uh, some ill health. So getting back in the swing of things and some more videos will will come soon. So hang in there.